Tony, I had a question for you about the heterogeneity of some of the results on the dairy intake on your clinical trials. I wondered whether they had looked at whether the supplementing dairy in people who had less than two servings a day compared to those who had more, because my understanding in weight loss was that if you didn't have enough milk and you ate, did sufficient, it worked. If you ate too and had too much, it didn't work. So I can't recall the details of... of of that meta exactly, but I think the, the take home message on, on trials of dairy to date is that we've got a, an enormous uh, mix of design issues, including um, what, what you've referred to in terms of baseline dairy, how much we're, uh, uh, what kind of a separation we're getting, the forms of dairy, duration, uh, what kind of outcomes, where the dairy's coming from, which I think is, is potentially important <coughs> given, uh, uh, given some of the the changes in, in macro and micronutrient profile. The fatty acid profile I showed was actually from New Zealand, which may not represent what we're seeing in, in fatty acid profile from, from other parts of the world. So the short answer is I don't have a clear answer for you. Yeah, I'm Patient Sobi from College of Pharmacy, Xavier University, New Orleans, USA. Um, this is addressed to three nuts. I just wanted to know whether you used a combination of nuts or are all the nuts producing the same metabolic effect on glucose? Uh, so the studies in the meta-analysis, there was uh, different trials using different types of nuts. Uh, when we did our subgroup analyses, we didn't see any significant uh, differences between trials that use, say, like almonds and or hazelnuts or walnuts. Um, so no, I wouldn't say there's specific uh, tree nut that showed this effect. So what advice do you give to people who have um, sensitivity to nuts? Well, I wouldn't advise that they <laughs> eat tree nuts. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's many other uh, ways that they can modify their diet to control their glycemia. So I wouldn't, if they have sensitivity or allergies to nuts, I wouldn't recommend for them to eat tree nuts. But for those that can, it's one way that they can modify their diet. Okay, thank you. David Jenkins. Um, Tony, in view of Osama's very impressive results with meal replacement, um, and one's looking then at sort of milk drinks, one's looking at protein drinks in many ways, do you think that we would get the same sort of effects with other protein drinks, for example, soy drinks or whatever, uh, that may have a low glycemic index and higher protein content? You know, uh, as long as you increase the protein intake, you will get benefits uh, on thermogenesis, on satiety, on stimulation in general of insulin and uh, GLP-1. Uh, but the most interesting is that if you modify the amino acids in a way that you know that it will stimulate more insulin and more uh, uh, GLP-1, it will be even better. So people who cannot get those meal replacement, definitely they can go with protein, um, you know, supplement. As long as the carbs uh, in them is not sugar and low glycemic index. Uh, what those may replacement added is that they added uh, more fiber, modified maltodextrin, uh, slowly absorbed. There is data now to show that maybe fermentation that occur in the terminal ileum and the colon is also stimulating uh, the uh, GLP-1 hormone. The other part is that, uh, of course, it will be fortified with mono monounsaturated fatty acids more than one you can get from protein drink. Yes, a question. First, back. First, that one, and then you. Um, thank you, Jenny Brand, Mellor University of Sydney. The message I'm taking away from the two sessions this morning is that if you take the typical control diet, and you take something out and replace it with many different things. They can be olive oil, or they can be nuts, or dairy foods, or even high protein hazelnut cream pies. So, so 
my question is, what is exactly wrong with the control diet? What are you taking out when you replace those calories? So one of the ways we might address that question is, is actually to pull all the data, pull the, the characteristics of the subjects and the diets and see what it is about the control diet. And my guess is it's something to do with the carbohydrates. Uh. You raised the very, very important points, and uh, uh, many of you have been on the ADA. Uh, there is one presentation which actually impressed me very, uh, very nicely, uh, although the data uh, needs some clarification. Uh, looking to when you give any diet, over time people regress to eat what they used to eat. So whatever you give them, higher protein, lower carb, higher fat, lower fat, they will eat back the same and the regression will be quite uh, changed. So this is a behavior component. And uh, this is a problem with uh, uh, early diet that, uh, or early study that was done by Frank Sack, Sachs. Uh, he gave different composition uh, and claimed that there is no difference between them. But the reality is that people, uh, by the end of the study, are eating exactly the same. No difference between them. Uh, that's why uh, it, it looks like uh, the best way is to go to what people usually eat. And that's what we did in the white weight. We formulated 17 menus from what people eat every single day. And then we changed the composition to increase what they eat from protein a little bit up, reduce the carbohydrates a little bit down, and modify slightly the salt and sugar and trans fat and so on. But it is the same meal. <coughs> so from their visual part, it is the same meal. And actually, it worked very well. The compliance is very, very good. If you get people a uh, very strict diet, vision diet, Atkins diet, Ornish diet, whatever, they will do it for a few weeks. But beyond those, they will not continue to do it. Thank I, you. Sorry, nice. I just wanted to add on. Um, there is a meta-analysis meta that I discussed uh, that was looking at the effect of tree nuts, specifically in individuals with diabetes. and so. Uh, the largest trials uh, in that meta-analysis actually used tree nuts to displace carbohydrates. So I just wanted to mention that since that's what you were asking about. Okay, now we have a question here. Then we have one time for one more question, I think. Thank you. I'm Sarah Madavi from Toronto. Um, my question is for Dr. Hamdi, who is sitting right beside Dr. Hanley. <laughs> um, very interesting and entertaining uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, as I was listening to your presentation, I couldn't help it but wonder what your recommendations would be for people who have diabetes and chronic kidney disease with regards to the protein portions that you're, you're recommending. Um, so if you could address that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is a big, big issue. You know, we had been living in a myth for years around protein. And in 2008, uh, I think in the, if you attended the ADA in 2008, we have a big debate. And I was debating the guy who implemented the whole concept of high, of low protein. In reality, if you cut that protein way down, uh, first of all, you will not save the kidney. There is no change in GFR. Big trial from all nephrologists, MD, uh, MDRD study, didn't show any benefit. In reality, uh, every time you cut the protein significantly down, uh, even you go to 0.6 gram per kilogram, which is an uh, intolerable diet, uh, those people get severe protein malnutrition, they lose muscle mass, they have hypoalbuminemia, they have edema, and when they go for dialysis, the mortality is significantly up. And that's why that whole concept is obsolete. In reality, many of the data, if you look to the uh, nurses' health study, the comparison between the first quartile and highest quartile of protein intake actually have the lowest ischemic heart disease. Uh, so it is the source of protein. We know that processed meat and meat may not be the best source of protein, but there are many very good sources of protein. I don't think that for renal, uh, you have to uh, reduce the protein uh, to any level. In reality, the kidney has very good capacity to compensate. Sorry, just a really quick follow-up question. So you're telling me that with, um, you know, nearing end-stage kidney disease, um, you know, stage three, stage four, that we would not reduce protein at all? Uh, quickly, quick. there is a study done in California showed that you can postpone dialysis for only six months. Okay. okay. Um, do we need to close the session, or can we have 
Okay, one short more question, because we, we're running out of time for lunch. Yeah, one short here. Uh, thank you for nice presentations. Ingrid Lövall Musta from Trondheim University Hospital in Norway. I have a question for Ursula. It was about the incidence of type 2 diabetes, I think, uh, regarding the omega-3 fatty acid intake from uh, supplements versus uh, fat fish. And my question is if the amount was the same, because I was wondering maybe the amount was a bit bigger from the supplements. That, that's a good point, and, and uh, be, uh, by eating fish, it's very difficult to, to achieve those amounts that you easily get by, by taking supplements. For example, by using supplements, it's very uh, easy to, to get one gram per, per day of, of uh, EPA plus DHA, but eating, eating uh, three uh, fish meals per week, of which one to two are, are fatty, fatty, uh, fatty fish, you, you get... Uh, um, roughly 250 milligrams per day. So that might be one, one issue. But there's a clear trend that if you use uh, fish or supplements, then, then it might, be, might not be that good for type 2 diabetes. But, but if you use, uh, use fish, there's no evidence that, that it's harmful for you. OK, thank you. I think we need to, <laughs> sorry. I, I know we, I myself, have a lot of questions I would like to put in everyone. But we need to, to stop here. <laughs>